how do you store data to make it useful? Simple. You put it in a database or a data warehouse or a lake. A lake house? Okay, not that simple. Let's figure things out. How does data storage work? And specifically, how do you store data for analysis and machine learning? Spreadsheets, the ultimate medium for all your business data. Why do you need a database when a good old Excel, or if you're adventurous and bold, Google Sheets do the job? Say you run a small fish market. You record each purchase with a unique ID, writing the buyer's name, delivery address, phone number, sales amount, type of fish, the quantity, and the date of purchase. You use it to contact your buyers, dispatch delivery, and track sales. You can even run some analytics on that. Daryl likes mackerel, Luna loves tuna, and nobody buys carp. But what happens if Daryl buys two mackerels and one bass? Should you record two different transactions, one for each type of fish? You have to repeat all this data. What if he buys 10 different types of seafood, even carp? Put that into the table. Then Luna changes her delivery address for the last order. Should you update all of her 50 address entries? Yes, she loves tuna that much. And as there are new sales every day, the table, now with thousands of rows, makes your old laptop freeze whenever you try to enter or retrieve data. It's not even the 90s. It's the 60s. OK, you want a database. Instead of recording everything in one table, you need six to organize things a bit. So you put all your orders into one table and assign unique IDs to them. Here, you record your customers and dates. That's it. Then you have a separate table for your order details, where each row records a separate fish type, quantity, and order ID. This way, Daryl's single order lands in the orders table, and two records go in the details table for two mackerels and one bass. Order ID then references the main orders table. The final column is fish price ID. Why? You want a separate table for your prices, another one for fish types, and how the prices match fish types. So you can read prices or update them if carp goes on sale or tuna is in demand. And let's reference this fish type match in the order details. Why so hard? Well, databases must be normalized. You try to avoid any redundancy. For example, we may have a $100 price tag for tuna, but also the same $100 price tag for marlin. So storing a single $100 price tag separately makes sense. And because of normalization, if Luna changes her address, you have a table for all your customers. You update the address once. Relational databases, like MySQL or PostgreSQL, are great for simple things like creating, reading, updating, and deleting rows of information. These tasks belong to what's called online transactional processing. You use simple and fast queries to a database to run your basic business operations, like recording the prices and names of the products and retrieving customer details to deliver that large marlin to their homes. Now, you can open your online web page, process thousands of transactions, and serve those fish lovers. But what happens if you want to analyze data? Say you want to calculate tuna sales over the last week. Well, you need a new table. First, the database will take the orders table, read it from left to right, and find all the rows that match the date. Then it will read the fish table to find the row with tuna in it. After that, it will take order details and what's left of the orders table and join them to choose only those purchases that fit the date. And let's join it with a fish table to keep only tuna sales. Then join it with fish prices and price tables filtering out everything that is not tuna to eventually display prices. The process may be more sophisticated than that, but you get the idea. Now that we have prices and quantity, we can finally calculate total sales for the week. Great, right? Well, there are a couple of problems. First, if you do that on your production database, which records sales multiple times per day and effectively runs your business operations, 
such an analytical query may slow things down a bit. It becomes even worse if you're no longer a small fish market on the corner, but a proud seafood beacon of your community. The database reads thousands of rows, filters through them, joins, and creates new tables. Salesmen ask your analytics guy to run those queries after midnight when customers sleep. In return, he asks for a raise. Not good. In the meantime, somebody's fish doesn't get any fresher. Another problem is keeping historical records. Yes, you write transactions, but what if you want to track other data points over time? Daryl changes his delivery addresses way too often, and you want to investigate. Maybe he's up to something. Okay, scratch that. You just want to see how your sales volumes depend on fish prices. Currently, you can add new prices to the price table, add new fish price matches, and, after many table joins, eventually arrive at the history of price changes. But it's still slow. You need something else. A data warehouse. A data warehouse is a special type of database made for analytics only, so that your analytics guy can have regular work hours while you explore some trends in your fish sales. The first and obvious improvement is that now you have two separate databases, one for your business operations and another for analytics. To get tuna information, you no longer have to freeze your sales process. You just extract this data from your database weekly or daily to run all those computations in a warehouse. You can even add some information from your website or office to track the sales channel, whether it was a walk-in customer, an online shopper, or a bulk order by phone. Some data transformation will also happen to, say, display dates with more granularity and include days, months, quarters, and years. And you load prepared data into a warehouse. Some popular warehouses are Microsoft SQL Server, Azure Synapse, Teradata, and Snowflake. But what happens inside of it? Unlike transactional databases that take various shapes and forms, warehouses tend to be very structured. A classical design of a warehouse is a star schema. If you can't see a star here, well, use your imagination. In the center of the star, you have the main fact table. It records key business metrics. In our case, fish sales. Let's say that a single sale corresponds to a single fish type. And if Daryl buys both mackerel and bass, we'll record them as separate sales, but assign the same order ID. This way, we can easily track the quantity of each fish sold and the sales amount. Let's also add prices here, just in case. What about normalization? Well, warehouses, unlike databases, tend to be denormalized, meaning that we can have redundancy for analytical purposes. Now, you can explore each sale from different angles or dimensions. To learn how much each customer buys, your fact table connects to a customer dimension table. To know how sales change over time, you have a time dimension. Which types of fish sell better? The fish dimension with prices. Which generates more sales? Store walk-ins or website orders? Channel dimension. And you can run much more complex queries, like what were the website bass sales to Bob over the last month? Since the fact table references all dimensions with their IDs, joining multiple of them and processing intricate analytical queries is easier. Another variation of this warehouse design is a snowflake schema, after which the most popular cloud warehouse was named. In a snowflake, each dimension has extra subdimensions and squint or use your imagination again, it reminds you of a snowflake. What about tracking historical data? Let's not explore the suspicious nature of Daryl's delivery addresses. Instead, we can track price changes. In the fish dimension table, we record the start date when we assigned the price and the last date before we changed it. We also note whether the price is current. So if carp goes on sale July 6th with a price drop from $35 to $15, just write the end date for the current carp price, create another row, assign a new fish ID, and record the start date with a new price. And there's another reason why warehouses are better for analytics. Remember how databases read the records? Yes, from left to right, row by row. Typically, databases store information in rows because it fits better for transactional operations. 
You add a new customer, you add a new row. You update the fish price, the database reads the rows and changes the corresponding price tag. Warehouses usually store and read data in columns. The system doesn't have to read all fish tables row by row. Instead, it reads only those columns that it needs. So you can take the changes to carp prices, plot them against carp sales, and try to understand how cheap it should be for people to start buying carp. Now you and your analytics team can happily collect, visualize, and analyze data with business intelligence tools like Power BI or Tableau. Perfect! So far, sales are your key metric, and you build your warehouse schema around it. The warehouse design is rigid and specific, as you know what you want to analyze and how you want to analyze it. You transform data to fit your warehouse design and analytical tasks. This approach is a schema on write, as you impose a specific data organization on storage. And so far, it's okay. But then your fish market attains regional status, or even national or international. You have global operations, hundreds of stores worldwide, with an online platform to share reviews, photos, and video recipes, all dedicated to fish. It generates terabytes of new records. Some data, like sales, is structured, meaning you can put it into a table, the table into a warehouse, and analyze it with BI tools. But what about images, texts, and videos from your online platform? They're all unstructured data. While it's possible to describe an image's pixels and color channels using a SQL table, it's a bit eccentric, even by modern standards. Can you store and analyze them? Say you want to run machine learning models on reviews and see what people like or dislike about your fish, or analyze photos with computer vision to decide the kinds of trout pictures that attract more likes. You're looking for a recipe for the perfect trout image. Or you want to save this data just in case. Maybe you come up with ideas later, but how do you store all those unstructured records before you know how to use them? For that, you're looking for a data lake. A data lake is storage where all the data, including unstructured, is kept in its raw form. So you extract and load everything first and then hope to transform and deal with it later. Just like your Europe Vacation 2008 unsorted folder on your old computer. You'll get there sometime. Not today, though. Instead of tables, you use folders with a hierarchical structure, like Azure Data Lake, or just a single flat storage, like Amazon S3, and dump it all there. It is what's called an object store. But how do you make this data useful? You won't be scrolling through all those images to find the ones related to trout. The answer to that is metadata, or the data about data. For images, it would be dates, resolution, and size, or if you are smart enough to assign tags to your fish photos and record likes, they can also be metadata. Once you ingest raw images into the lake, use data integration services such as AWS Glue or Google Data Catalog to automatically extract this metadata and organize it in a more structured way, like SQL tables or JSON files. These tables and files will reference unstructured data and help you find and retrieve the ones you're looking for. Now, having data querying and analytics tools like Presto or Amazon Athena, you can look for all the images tagged trout, sort them by the number of likes, and try to build a machine learning model predicting the perfect trout image. This approach is called schema on read, as you organize data when pulling it for analysis or machine learning. If you succeed, you can deploy this machine learning model and automatically choose the best trout image for your online store from dozens of options that your designer suggests. While a data warehouse is a tool for analysts and management, a lake is more of a toy for data scientists and machine learning engineers. They love playing with raw data, so transforming and applying schema on read makes sense. And yet, you still have two storages one for critical sales information, and another for unstructured data. But you may want to link them and explore really specific questions. Which of our customers post the most popular videos? Maybe we should reward them. Do reviews impact our revenue? Is there a link between positive reviews and better sales? 
Eventually, you want a single place to store all your analytics and let everyone on your team play with data and answer their weird questions. A lake house is the most modern type of storage that links structured and unstructured data into a single data platform. Databricks Lakehouse, or Google's BigQuery, belong to this breed. Let's see how it might work. Normally, lakehouses have three layers. First, we pull data from all our sources and load it in a single object store location, a lake. All sales, fish types, customers, reviews, images, and videos land here. This is the storage layer. Then, the lakehouse extracts all the metadata and stores it in a separate catalog in a structured format, a metadata or staging layer. At the consumption or semantic level, query engines such as Presto connect to the object store and metadata, allowing both data scientists and analysts to transform and query what they want. For example, your analysts need that warehouse. The system would take all structured records, including metadata for images, reviews, or videos, and apply the transformations, adjust dates, addresses, currencies, etc. For reviews, maybe you want to enrich the data and calculate the sentiment score for each review, adding the text and the numbers of likes. Then, you can apply the standard star schema with an additional fact table for reviews. You have dates, fish types, and customers as shared dimensions for these two tables. Now your analysts use Tableau, or Power BI, to plot mackerel review sentiment against mackerel sales and see whether positive reviews improve your bottom line, a warehouse. In the meantime, data scientists can connect tools like Jupyter Notebook to capture warehouse, metadata, and raw records. They can play with finding perfect fish pictures, predicting sales, or extracting fish mentions from videos to see what's trending. Anyone can use any data for any purpose on the Lakehouse platform. It's the latest development. So let's see where we get from here. So, how do you store data to make it useful? Simple. You put it in a database, or a data warehouse, or a lake, or a lake house. It may actually be complex, just a matter of questions you're trying to answer with data. Thank you for watching. If you want to learn how to source data, check out this video on streaming. If you want a general theory, we have a data engineering explainer. See you next time.